The mysteries surrounding archangels are, as you might imagine, quite difficult to unpick. And perhaps that's what makes them so fascinating, in that there is so much intrigue surrounding their vague presence in the Bible. While the Bible is full of ambiguity with some of its characters, there is perhaps no one more ambiguous than the archangel known as Michael. Yet despite his minuscule presence in the Bible, Archangel Michael has cultivated a massive devotion from not only those from the Christian faith, but also the Jewish and Islamic faiths as well, given that Archangel Michael appears across all three religious texts in some capacity. However, there are those that would believe that Archangel Michael's appearance in this manner is subject to interpretation. In this video, we'll be primarily focusing on Michael's presence in the Bible, as this is a Biblical Stories Explained series, but I will be touching on stories and legends originating from both Jewish and Islamic texts to give you an unbiased and hopefully more complete picture on who Archangel Michael really is, as well as what he means to people today. He is considered to be the Biblical God's finest champion, a being so powerful that he is able to banish Lucifer from heaven by himself, without direct intervention from God. His name, which means, he who is as God, is usually considered to be an angel of protection, and perhaps the most powerful of all of God's angels. It goes without saying that as the most powerful, Michael is the leader within the realm of angels, and serves as a warrior to defeat the forces of evil in all of their forms. But did you know that Archangel Michael is only mentioned a total of six times in the Bible? He is mentioned three times in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, where he is merely mentioned by another unknown entity, and later on again in the New Testament, in his battle with Lucifer and the other fallen angels. He's also seen in the epistle of Jude in a debate with Satan and is again alluded to in the first epistle of the Thessalonians, though he is not explicitly named in this instance. In all of these accounts though, the scripture supporting Archangel Michael is loose at best and as I mentioned earlier, perhaps this is where the fascination with angels stems from, in that the Bible does not tell us much about this bold and brilliant persona. Archangel Michael's first mention comes out of the Old Testament in the book of Daniel, and it is virtually just that, a mention. Daniel, something of a prophet for God, prays to his Lord in hopes that he will bring some stability to the turmoil in Israel, and hopes to confess all of the sins of his people. During this prayer, a being makes himself known, and is described in Daniel 10 5-6 as a man dressed in linen, with a belt of fine gold from Upaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. While this man is never explicitly identified, it is understood that this being is not mortal, and that he is of a supernatural composition. His presence in Daniel 10 10 through 20 sees this entity explained to Daniel what will happen to his people, and what lies in Israel's fate in the times coming. What's most interesting about these passages is that the entity, powerful as he appears to be, claims that he has been resisted by the Prince of Persia, and that this has delayed him in reaching Daniel. In Daniel 10.13, he states that the Prince of the Persian Kingdom resisted me for 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. While the nature of Michael's help is not detailed beyond this, we can gather that the entity in question is reinforced by Michael, and thus, on the side of God. The fact that Michael came to help this entity shows us perhaps the basis of which his reputation as a protector stems from. Michael's involvement at all also serves to show Daniel that the entity which has approached him is on God's side, for Michael works only with God's divine intentions in mind. Some have speculated that this entity is actually Archangel Gabriel, another of the suspected archangels in religious scripture, most notably Judaism. But many dispute this idea, as this figure is never addressed as Gabriel in this chapter. Previously, Daniel hears Gabriel's voice in chapter 8 verse 16, when Daniel is having a vision. He states, And I heard a man's voice from the Uli calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. In the next verse, Gabriel speaks and says, Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. Furthermore, Gabriel actually appears before Daniel in chapter 9 verse 21, 
where Daniel explains, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. So if the entity speaking of Michael was actually Gabriel, then Daniel should have recognised him, instead of being overcome by the sheer awe of him, where he is noted as trembling on his hands and knees. Unless of course, as some have suggested, Gabriel has only shown himself to Daniel in a lesser form, and when he appears to him again in chapter 10, he comes as his true self, hence why Daniel only chooses now to describe the entity's appearance. All in all though, the reference of Gabriel as man, in the title of the chapter called Daniel's Vision of a Man, seems to indicate that this is not Gabriel, and while obviously otherworldly, is merely a messenger bringing word of Michael. By the end of their encounter in 1020-21, through the entity further confirms his allegiance with Michael by saying, Do you know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the Prince of Persia, and when I go, the Prince of Greece will come. But first I will tell you what is written in the Book of Truth. No one supports me against them, except Michael, your Prince. By calling Michael Daniel's Prince, it highlights his importance and gives us something of an inkling that Michael harnesses some sort of higher power and that he should be respected and revered by Daniel, and therefore Daniel's people. However, beyond this, we can't do much more than speculate. The prophecy is finally concluded in chapter 12, and Michael is brought up one last time, his final mention in the entirety of the Old Testament, where the entity explains, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress, such as has not happened from the beginning of nations, until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Essentially, Daniel was being told that Michael would be the one who brought salvation upon Israel, and once more, his status as a protector is furthermore cemented. Beyond this, it's hard to gather a real sense as to who Michael is, and what his greater attributes are. Based on the Old Testament alone, defining Michael is a difficult task, because frankly, he isn't physically present. We are able to deduce some idea as to what the Archangel's role is, and that is the dispelling of evil forces, some say demons. If we take the demon analogy, there are those that believe the Prince of Persia, for lack of any real identity, is in fact a demon. If this is the case, then we can derive from this encounter that angels and demons engage in spiritual battles, and perhaps this is why Daniel is unable to understand or convey the gravity of what is actually happening in this encounter, for it is beyond him to comprehend the conceptuality of angels battling demons. Still, we get a much better understanding into Archangel Michael's persona much later in the New Testament, most notably the Book of Revelation. Some of you may wish to refresh your memory by watching my Lucifer video for this part of the video, but to keep things brief, the biblical God created a perfect being, a beautiful creation that was so divine and mighty when in comparison to his peers that he grew woefully arrogant. As you may remember, his name was Lucifer, and before long, he believed that he was above God and that he was worthy enough to rule the heavens instead. Worse yet, many took to Lucifer's charisma and passion and believed that he could overthrow their God and so joined him in his quest of usurpation. Unfortunately for Lucifer though, challenging God would be a secondary concern for him, because first, he had to get through resistance led by Michael himself. A fierce battle took place, but Lucifer soon realised that Michael was stronger than expected. So Lucifer transformed himself into a dragon, as noted in Revelation 12 7-8, and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels prevailed not neither was their place found any more in heaven. From these passages, we understand Michael a little better. We already gathered that from his elusive counter with the Prince of Persia, that Michael was a fighter, likely one who fought resiliently for the glory of his god. But like most battles, the measure of a man is determined by how big his enemy is. The Prince of Persia had given hassle to the unknown entity for 21 days, and going by his prophecy, Michael would prevail showing us that he succeeded where others did not. But the Prince of Persia was a relatively unknown adversary, and so we cannot comprehend how much of a fight Michael was actually given. But with a character so bold as Lucifer, a creature created perfectly by God, we can mostly agree 
that this pitted Michael against an enemy of equal skill. Some might even say it put Michael at a disadvantage, that he was facing off against God's favourite angel turned bad boy. From this we can derive that Michael is certainly courageous, that he would even think about going head to head against Lucifer, a being who had been created by God to be perfect. By that logic, Michael may have considered his own mortality, in a duel with someone like Lucifer, but without hesitation, Michael is said to have defeated Lucifer and all of his angels. Furthermore, Michael demonstrates loyalty in that he doesn't turn away from God and join Lucifer, where so many other angels chose to do so. It's also notable that during this battle, when things are looking bleak for Lucifer, Lucifer turns into a dragon and makes one last assault upon Michael, only to be defeated anyway. While it's not specified if Michael had this ability to transform as well, he chooses not to, and faces Lucifer as he had done from the beginning of the battle. Some might say that this is a testament to his skill as a warrior, that he did not see it necessary to face Lucifer as anything other than himself. Others would agree that his stance in the battle was one of fearlessness, and that his facing of Lucifer, even in his dragon form, only shows us that the power of God flows through him, and that he is something of a conduit for God's justice and punishment. We see Michael mentioned again in a rather ambiguous confrontation between himself and Satan in Jude 1.9. The writings of Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, is featured in the Bible as he addresses a letter to his friends, reminding them to pay respects to God and not allow the failures of the likes of Cain, Sodom, Gomorrah and even what appears to be the angels of Lucifer to influence them in any way. During this lengthy rant, Jude also cites an incident between Archangel Michael and Satan where they were debating the body of Moses. He says, But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand, and the very things that they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. The event that Jude speaks of does not seem to appear anywhere else in the scripture, and Jude doesn't try to explain it either, thus assuming his friends knew what he was talking about, which they may very well have done so. All we know from this though, is that Michael somehow found his way into the company of Satan, and that Moses' body was the reason for their arguing. Some say that this was because Satan opposed God's decision to raise Moses to eternal life, because Moses had sinned, or that God was considering letting Moses into the promised land after all, and that Satan detested this threatening terrible things if this was to happen. Others suggest that Jude is referencing the story from an apocryphal text, in adjacent to the Old or New Testament, in which details the account that Jude speaks of. Supposedly, some source this book as being titled The Assumption of Moses, or The Testament of Moses, but these books appear to be either lost or are missing chapters according to some scholars. Ultimately though, Our conjectures, nor the conjectures of the scholars, bring us much closer to the real understanding of what Michael and Satan were arguing about in relation to Moses' body. Some do not see the reason for Michael and Satan arguing as the thing to take away from this encounter, but more so how Michael reacts in the proper Christian way. Michael tells Satan in the heat of their argument, the Lord rebuke you. His only four words in the entire scripture, might I add which shows us that he himself is not sinking to Satan's level in his argument. He is not physically engaging Satan, nor condemning Satan for his words, but telling Satan that God will deal with him. His refusal to personally attack Satan serves as a lesson to believers that they should not exact justice for themselves and should allow God to work his plan. It also shows believers that if one such as Michael is refusing to address a demon, then believers themselves should not address them either even if they mean to banish them, for this should be left to their god. This brings me to the mentioning of the Archangel in Thessalonians 4.16, where St. Paul writes to the Christians in Thessalonica. He states, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the Archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. You'll notice he does mention an Archangel, but this word is preceded by the, as in, the Archangel, suggesting that there is only one. Whether or not this is Michael or not is of course unknown to us, but what's interesting about this passage is that it shows us another role of the Archangel, in that it is his voice that will come to earth 
in the end times and signaling the rising of the dead. Some translations of this text indicate that the Lord being referenced in this passage is Jesus, and that it is Jesus, whether as God or the Son of God, who is using the voice of the Archangel. By this, many go on to say that Jesus and this Archangel are one in the same, because if Michael is the Archangel, as in the only Archangel, then he is the single most powerful creation of God. But then, Jesus is also said to have been God's most powerful creation, and so many conclude that these two must share the same existence. Other beliefs include that it was Jesus who was present against the battle against Lucifer in Revelations, and that he was the one leading the army of angels. Given that the Bible does not mention two armies, one led by Jesus and the other led by Archangel Michael, there exists belief that these two are actually one in the same. Today, there are those that believe that Archangel Michael is amongst us on earth, and that his role as a divine protector has not changed over time. It's understood that many believers call upon Archangel Michael in time of need, particularly in times of potential danger, in that Michael will answer them and deliver them safely from a certain circumstance. There are many who believe that they can feel Archangel Michael's presence when they have summoned him, usually if they have been successfully removed from a dangerous circumstance or if they feel protected. Uplifting feelings of warmth, inner peace, and flashing lights are also said to be common signs that Archangel Michael is amongst those who have summoned him. Others claim to have even heard Archangel Michael speak to them with guidance, similarly to how the unnamed man spoke to Daniel. But in any case, whether you believe in Archangel Michael as a champion of the biblical God, as Jesus Christ, or as an entity that wanders through earth offering aid and guidance, do let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Let me know who you'd like to see next on Biblical Stories Explained. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button. Until the next time guys.